gentlemen, I'm so glad that this is closing our Southern Montapalooza weekend because we're closing with one of the pioneers. We're closing with someone who uh, practically invented, well, practically, I say practically, because there, uh, there, there was Lon Chaney, but Jack Pierce uh, was probably, is probably the single hugest influence on monster movies or horror movies up to the present day. So I'm very happy to introduce the host of this panel, my friend of 23 years, Mr. Scott Essman. signed a contract. So he worked really as a staff member of Universal, but he was not under contract at all. His formative years were 1928 to 1947, and he did every monster makeup that came through the studio uh, relevant to Monster Palooza. He did not just do that kind of work, though. If you see his other work on movies like Showboat, he did beautiful age work. He was very good with hair work. And as we'll see later in the show, he did a lot of things after Universal that were remarkable. But of course, how do you go wrong with the Universal Monsters? As you see, uh, he did the Frankenstein monster, uh, the many different wolf men of the original era, uh, the mummy and all of its sequels, uh, and several other films uh, that were among the best ever produced by the studio. So we're going to talk about Pierce today. I have some wonderful guests pictured who are waiting to come up. And we're going to start off with an icebreaker video that I hope you enjoy. Uh, this was specially made just for today. And uh, this is a nice introduction to who Pierce is and what he did. Enjoy. It was uh, edited and compiled from many different sources by a man named Steve Austin, who made an excellent film called uh, Willis O'Brien Creation that's worth seeing. Thank you guys so much for being here. Look at all of those faces out there. Uh, again, if you did not get a flyer, please see the attendant at the door to get your uh, Jack Pierce flyer. I'm going to introduce our special guests now. Uh, our first guest has a staggering 39 Emmy nominations for Best Makeup, and eight of those were victories for Best Makeup. She's done amazing work in prosthetics, special makeup effects, props, straight makeups, everything you can imagine. Uh, an ingenious person who I'm very, very lucky to have here today. She's uh, not only an uh, expert in makeup, but she's a producer now too, and works on many of the shows you love, including American Horror Story and 911. Let me introduce Aaron Kruger McCash. Yeah. James Cameron, he calls this guy. So Steven Spielberg, the robots in AI, he calls this guy. And a million other movies, if I listed his credits, it would be five o'clock, and that'd be the end of this whole thing. Mr. Shane Patrick Mayhem.
Is that a panel or what? Let's get right into it. The Universal Horror Films, many of which you saw up there, were brilliantly photographed, brilliantly directed, brilliant production design, and the later ones, amazing music. But I'll tell you, without the characters, there is no movie. So my first question for all of our guests is, how important is Jack Pierce, in terms of a contributing artist, to these classic horror movies, including but not limited to Dracula and Frankenstein and The Wolfman, The Mummy, The Bride of Frankenstein, and millions of others. So I'll start off with Aaron. How critical is the makeup artist to the success of a classic film? Well, these, I always watch these movies just for the makeup, so, because that's what I love. So I think, uh, I think at the time, audiences hadn't seen anything frightening like that in, in the 30s and 40s. And it's an integral part of the, the film, the entire film. I think a lot of, a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of it can be melodramatic when you look back on it compared to modern, modern filmmaking. And you just want to see the monsters. You know, you want to see the changes and the, the drama and them walking through towns and you know, all the, the sadness with the, I, I think it's like the, the most important part. So of course the makeup artist is directly responsible for that. Jack Pierce, critical to the success. Mr. Mayhem. I would say that you have to think of the fact that, that none of those creatures had ever been seen before or dreamed of before. And it was not by committee, not by huge art departments, not by big uh, studio executives that make mandates of what they're supposed to be. It was the, the uh, culmination of, of the director James Whale and the magnificent face structure of Karloff that added so much to at least the Karloff look, but all the other ones as well. But you have to also think that uh, what you're looking at is the, the, the condition of what was considered special effects of its day. It was just a man with grease paint and hair and time because Frankenstein during the Depression made $12 million because of the creation of the Frankenstein monster's look. And in those compared dollars to today, it's, it's huge and it saved Universal. So one little guy from Greece who was a failed camera assistant, not failed, but he'd done that. Basically, Universal Studios would not be around today if it wasn't for those films. Thank you very much. I, in full agreement, one thing that Shane said to unpack for you guys is a lot of stuff now is done by committee because the studios are owned by corporations. Every studio you can think of, no matter what it is, there's a corporate structure on, on top of it. So there's a million people who have ideas about what things look like and how things are made and the script. Back then, in let's say Frankenstein, the first film, 1931, Carl Lumley Jr. was the only one, other than James Whale, who said yes or no to something in the movie. That was it. His father, who owned the studio, Carl Lumley, didn't know anything about horror movies and let his son do his work and make these films by his own instinct that they would be classic films. But that was it. James Whale, Carl Lumley Jr., period, right? That's it. And of course, Carl Lumley Jr. trusted uh, Pierce in 1928 to be the department head of the whole studio. So he had an instinct and he went with it and Pierce knocked it out of the park. How, how important, you, ha you having been with Spielberg and Toby Hooper and amazing directors uh, through your career, how important is the makeup artist to the success of the characters we love in a movie? And, and especially uh, Jack here. Well, uh, just to distinguish anything I might have to say from those terrific contributions there, <laughs> Uh, I would uh, call up the old phrase, chicken and egg, you know. When I was a little boy, and now we love stories, everybody so oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I saw these horror movies uh, fitfully on television because they, they came whenever the people had programmed the local stations. This was before video and before streaming, before anything but television itself. There used to be a program colorfully called Weird Weird World when I was a boy. And I'd wait to see in the TV guide, what are they going to show this week? And uh, I would watch these things. So what I meant about chicken and the egg was I saw the monsters first. I didn't know what makeup was. But 
what was the power of makeup? Well, it was that that could be uh, realized, it could be created. And when I caught on to that, then I thought, I've got to find out what this makeup stuff is. <laughs> so it's a, it, it's a way in, it became kind of a wormhole into the business for me as a hobby and later a profession. So uh, how important? It sustained my life for 40 years, makeup. And also Jack Pierce as a kind of a beacon, and I'm sure Aaron and Shane are on the same page. We all look to people whose work inspires us once we get inside the business. Uh, and the clarity and the, just the uh, perfection of what he came up with. Plus, he had the advantage of working some more wonderful actors, and he didn't get in the way. When you think of any of those makeups, even when a guy's inundated, like Portland Cheney Jr., the Wolfman, Cheney comes through that thing because he was very big, rather like his father. Well, you, the makeup, if anything, toned him down. Made him sexier than he was with his naked face. You know, you, like when he became a, a whole other thing as, I mean, outside of monster persona, I made another presence in those movies and those makeups. So, uh, yeah, come, coming full circle, makeup has a hell of a, a, a influence upon people and upon movie going. So it depends on the vehicle, and is it appropriate? It, they needed somebody to put those movies over, and they were very lucky to have Jack Pierce. Yeah. It's a fortuitous conflagration of great directors at the studio, as I said, great cinematographers, Arthur Edison shot Frankenstein, great uh, behind the scenes people as far as their crafts and production design, Jack Otterson, beautiful production design, Charles D. Hall, beautiful production design. You could really do an entire session on each of those, can't you? Right? The cinematography of the movies, the music of the movies, the sound of the movies, and so forth. Um, but obviously makeup and Pierce, critical to the early success. I want to ask another question of our panel. Pierce did all these characters, and he hit a home run with every one of them. How uncommon is that for one artist to create so many amazing characters given the opportunity to do those horror films? And I don't need to say them again, but obviously the bride herself. What an amazing character. And she's in the movie, what, two to three minutes, period? That's it. Um, the Frankenstein monster, the three with Karloff, Lon Chaney played the monster, Glenn Strange, uh, Bella Lugosi even did it once. He's done amazing work with all those. Clearly, Karloff had the best face of all of those, right, to do the monster makeup. But all of them worked. They were all successful characters. So how, how uncommon is it not necessarily in this day and age, but in any age, for one guy, one artist, one visionary, to have so many amazing successes. We'll start with Aaron. I mean, I think with, in, in modern times, you have, um, you know, Dick Smith and Rick Baker and Stan Winston and many people who are an integral part of the production as well and making sure that the the actors that are cast are going to be um, contributing to the, you know, bringing forth the incredible acting and through the makeup, which is a really big part of it. So I think that back in the, you know, 30s and 40s, it was, he had a, a Jack Pierce had a huge part in choosing and uh, who was going to play the monster. So um, I think that's part of it, is that um, he was already obviously a brilliant person. He finally found his niche, you know, of having been in different crew members over the years. And he had this brilliance in him. And also, I think a lot of it had to do with that nobody had ever seen anything like that, as Shane mentioned. Nobody had ever seen any monsters like that. And you have to remember, too, there wasn't, there was newspapers. Um, there wasn't even that many magazines back then. And the only time you would see that is when you went to the movie to see it. So you didn't know how things were done, and it was just an incredibly magical uh, experience to see these monsters on film. So I think a lot of it was his own creativity that, that made them so successful. And they still are so, I mean, they're just iconic. They're so brilliant. And you can show a picture of the Frankenstein monster from the 1931 film, right? <clears throat> to a child of five, all the way up to someone who's 100 years old, and they'll say that's Frankenstein. They won't say Frankenstein monster, which is the correct way. But they'll identify it as Frankenstein, right? Oh, Frankenstein. How many characters can you say that about in movie history? Certainly Craig Z.T. 
You show that as a child. Oh, you show E.T., the picture of a child all the way up to a senior citizen, they're going to say E.T. And there's several other characters. Um, one beautiful work that Eric has done, uh, things that Chain has done, especially, like say, the Jurassic Park T-Rex. People are going to say Jurassic Park. But other than that, the list gets very small. Dick Smith, Exorcist, Makeup, um, Linda Blair is one of them. Once you get outside of, you know, 10 or 20 names, how many people are going to really identify all those? And that's exactly what Aaron's talking about, Jack Pierce, being so creative, created these icons, one after another, all through the 30s and 40s. It's amazing. Mr. Mayhem, please. How uncommon is it for one artist to hit so many home runs with so many projects in that period? Uh, it, it is uncommon, but I, I don't know how much of his backstory is in art training. I don't know if there is much at all, but I do know that he's fairly self-taught as a makeup artist and kind of apprenticed here and there. But he certainly had an artistic eye, a very good eye for balance and, and, and uh, the composition. And you're, when you're working with cotton and latex and chamois cloth and like just nothing, that's where I marvel at it because that's why the difference is between what's next to Craig is like a, a live cast of Boris Karloff, if you could be so kind. And imagine it started that way in the morning and then pieces of cotton with, with latex or collodion would be carefully molded into the face from scratch every day. And then keeping the continuity of that mess, because it can be a real mess, I've seen it We've all tried to do it, and it can be a very, very messy process, but I watched the film, there's a continuity to that makeup, it's clean, as opposed to a sculpted piece, which is a piece of, what, what in, you know, the latter films when they wouldn't allow Jack to take the time to do it. You know, there's a transition, and there's a moral uh, to the story, which is you have to uh, accept change and advance in technologies and kind of move forward, because that was ultimately sort of Jack's, Demise and replacement was was that laborious uh, technique, but but to come the the well of his imagination to to get the mummy and you know even Lugosi's makeup and all of it is, is astonishing. Thank you very much. Uh, two things on what Shane said: apprenticeship. There was no makeup union back then in the twenties when Pierce was learning makeup. It was all very informal. But, and this is very hard to confirm now, it's 100 years ago, the information is that Jack Pierce and Lon Chaney <coughs> Sr. were both on the Universal lot at the same time, freelancing and doing small gigs, and assistant cameraman, uh, stuntman, Pierce did all this stuff, he was an actor. I'm 90% sure, can confirm, that Pierce learned a great deal of techniques from Lon Chaney. 90% sure. Uh, they would have been friends, they were about the same age, and they were on the Universal lot at the same time, and Cheney was doing some amazing things. Uh, first at Universal, and then as a freelancer. Um, definitely, Pierce owes some of his knowledge and ability to that of Juan Cheney. The second thing that you said about the, uh, the, the demise, Pierce was replaced by a man named Bud Westmore. Bud Westmore is a, the famous Westmores of Hollywood. And in 1947, Universal hired him, Bud Westmore. Wally Westmore was at Paramount. Hearst Westmore was at Warner Brothers, and many other Westmores in the industry. So I think they felt like they were getting a sure thing. The Lemleys were long gone. As a matter of fact, by then, Carl Lemley Sr. had passed away. Carl Lemley Jr. was almost out of the business by then. So they didn't have any allegiance to Pierce, no loyalty. And they said, let's get a Westmore to run the department. And that's what happened, so he was replaced. Um, sadly and, uh, and unfortunately. Uh, Mr. Reardon, same question please. How uncommon is it for an artist to hit so many home runs out of the park, character after character after character after character, with very little uh, flaws in these characters? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, it, uh, it's as uncommon as the person is uncommon. And uh, I think that uh, Jack had been a very uncommon person. He was very stubborn. He was very insistent upon his way of doing things. That's something you often find uh, combined with people who have a very particular point of view. 
And a particular point of view doesn't necessarily mean you're creative or you're going to come up with anything distinctive, but it's, it, it can be an element. You know, in other words, I see it this way. And if and it was the case back then where they were basically deferring to them. They, you know, the guy over there, in our, he's the head of our music department, he, he handles it. There are many, many stories that some of the terrific famous directors of the Hollywood heyday, they never dealt with anybody directly. They just came in and did their job, which speaks to the changing, you know, uh, the atmosphere of later years in which we worked, all of us, where you have this constant swimming committee of voices you have to uh, adjust to, and you have to take their input, and you have to use a hell of a lot of diplomacy, and uh, try to, after all that input, some of it unsolicited, like lots of it, you've still got to try to do Jack Pierce's thing, which is that, well, I think, but you might have to, uh, you know, do it very surreptitiously. <laughs> So, uh, you know, creativity and a good idea will out. In other words, it will get through, as it has done with Aaron and Shane's and hopefully my work, but it's an uphill battle sometimes. That was the adv advantage Jack had. The disadvantage, as time went by, was just articulated by Shane, which is where schedules became like, when the F are we going to get the Frankenstein monster? Well, Jack's still working on it. Well, it's been four half an hour, so, you know, it gets to a point where, like, this is a B movie for Christ's sake, you know? And uh, the business side gets inflamed, whereas the artistic side isn't appreciated, really. It's like, I don't care. I mean, you know, this is costing money. It was the bean counter thing began to play, come into play. And, uh, but, who, it should be, I, I should mention the fact when Bud took over, he was only 29 years old. And, uh, so, I mean, he brought with him the kind of training and mindset of the Westmore clan, which was, who can do this, and let's get, uh, let's get a team together here, which really was the, the paradigm for the future. And that's how most things have been done since then. Uh, depending on the job that may come someone's way, if it's small enough, you do it yourself. I was, a, I was a nutcase for trying to do things myself, but that was because I was brought up looking at people like Jack Pierce, or a, another hero of mine, you, many of you have heard of Ray Harryhausen, who was very, very hands-on, very direct, right? I got to know Ray, never got to meet Jack, I wish. Uh, but even inspirational characters, to some extent, too, Dick Smith came up through that, and I was very fortunate to meet Dick at a young age. Dick, by the way, saw Jack Pierce once in public, he was out here, I think, for a mad world, and he saw him at a drugstore or something. Yeah, you saw a fragment of it there, and he was so overwhelmed that he didn't do anything about it. He couldn't, Dick Smith, you know what? Dick Smith didn't think he was Dick Smith. Do you know what I'm saying? So he saw Jack Pierce, and he just was tongue-tied, and he just let the moment go by because he couldn't go up and approach this hero of his. So, uh, and I might add also that Jack did get some press during his years at Universal. I've been shown some stuff from like Dan Roebuck's collection. Interesting, you know, interviews with him, pictures of the newspaper. You know, he, he wasn't completely undercover, but uh, it didn't save his job because Bud could come in and get the Frankenstein monster out of the chair and whatnot, maybe an hour and a half. So wow, we've got what? You know, we've got two and a half more hours to play with the Frankenstein one, et cetera. Where do we start? I don't want to go any further. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm overstating my question. No, this is brilliant. Let me tell you guys. So the early people to do this kind of work were definitely uh, Jack Dawn, who ended up at uh, MGM, responsible for the Wizard of Oz characters. Lon Chaney and Jack Pierce. Those three started off in an industry that they were inventing as they went. There was no school for makeup back then. Now there's all these makeup schools. There was no book on how to do things, nothing like that. So they worked with their hands and they created these things. The torch was then passed to uh, two gentlemen primarily uh, in the next round, which was uh, certainly a person like Dick Smith, who was born in 1922 and worked at NBC and then did films. Uh, for over 30 years until he retired. And uh, Dick Smith had a contemporary named John Chambers, who's worth mentioning too. So we go the Cheney, 
Jack Pierce, Jack Don, to Dick Smith and John Chambers, and they opened up a lot of doors for people. And then, after that, we get to the wonderful people we have on stage, and others who aren't here today, including Greg Cannon, Rick Baker, the late Stan Winston, uh, yes, I stand for them. And, uh, and then the torch is now passed again to younger folks who are coming up. So these things have gone in stages, but uh, this is something you guys might not know. There was no Academy Award for Best Makeup until 1981. The Oscars started in 1927. First Best Picture was Wings. No Oscar for Makeup. 37, 47, 57, 67, 77, 54 years. I've got, I've got an anecdote that you guys will enjoy. Uh, I know nobody knows this. Have, I, have you guys ever seen a picture of Jack getting an award for Boris Karloff and Money Sits for the Money, right? Yeah. Okay, this is a true story. I worked at Universal, which was in a different department at that time. And there was a one, you know, they had these functional rooms, like enlarged makeup rooms. And I was poking around where I didn't belong underneath a sink. And first of all, I just gonna say this anyhow, that's, not, that's fuck all to do with Jack Pierce, but I took out a picture from Janet Lee inscribed to Bud Westbrook. It said, Bud, I love you anyway, even though you got the powder in my hair and you fuck up the issue. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, but then I saw something jammed in the corner. It was his award. The Hollywood Film Award. It was there, and I held it in my hand and I recognized it from that picture. I wish I'd stolen it because <laughs> no, nobody would have cared, and it probably went in the dumpster when they emptied out the department. And you know, by the way, I had a, an interview on the lot, and I drove by a dumpster and I saw things from the makeup lab all piled in it like garbage, life masks, uh, Anne Blind's mermaid tail from Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid, uh, all this beautiful this spun metal. Uh, Heads used for ball caps. They didn't care. They just needed to get that junk out of there. And that was Pierce's makeup on the logo. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very sad. Uh, my next question is for everyone. This is a surprise question. They don't know I'm going to ask this. We did rehearse this. And I'll ask Perry to come into the light because I'm going to ask him as well. If you could take three characters that Pierce did from his huge coterie of characters and put them in a time capsule and bury them in the earth, and it says on a, on a plaque of stone that says not to be open until, you know, it's 2023, 2233, let's say. Which three would you take? And which three would you put in there of all of his work? And we haven't even scratched the surface in that video of all the stuff he did, but we're gonna see a few new ones in a bit. What would you say, Eric? I think that it would be kind of the standard ones because I would wanna see them up close with my own eyes. So I, I would think it would be the bride, it would be the wolf man, and it would be Frankenstein's monster. Right. I just think it would be, that would is what I would want to see in person because there's so many times that people recreate them sometimes, you know, recreate them or they make homage makeups to them and sometimes you're looking at things and you're like, I can't really see that part there. I would love to see them, those three. Bride, wolf man, and? The first Frankenstein monster, the original one. Yes, the original. You did three with Karloff. Bride, son, and then the original movie, I don't think it ever looked as good as it did in the first Frankenstein. There was just something magical about it. The first time you see him turn around in the doorway and there's three closer and closer shots. It never looked as good as that. Well, probably also because he had more weight on him than the, uh, Karloff had more weight on him in, in subsequent films and he was just very thin. And and I think he didn't take his, a bridge out of his cheek to make yep. that hollow spot. So, yep. yeah, it was just different. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayhan, three three characters for the time capsule. No, well, Aaron stole all the <laughs> answers. <laughs> so, sorry. I have nothing to say. No, I'm going to pick some obscure ones. I'm going to say Conrad Veidt, no man who laughs. Yeah. Really? I'm going to say um, a weird little uh, ape makeup that just predates Planet of the Apes. And, Amazing one called The Monkey Talks. So good. And I think that the Igor makeup is actually very, very good on um, Bella. Mm -hmm. As an alt, which uh, is what we're bearing, I think that would be good. Yeah, but The Mummy is great. Yeah, you know, The Mummy is one of the best. I just stole Craig's answer. <laughs> <laughs> Bella is uh, the original son of Frankenstein. And then he comes back and goes to Frankenstein. That's an excellent character. It's very, very good. Mr. Reardon, 
They cleaned me out. So, yeah, I mean, what you can also cite is the fact that there were slight variations, which have been noted in the Matt Frankenstein, in the, yep. in the Wolfman. Yep. Uh, so it, you really want to slice it thin. Uh, I can pick the Wolfman from Frankenstein, he's the Wolfman, which I think improves upon the one of the original. And I think subsequent ones don't hit that particular peak. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't the volume of characters, the number, individual number of things he did, but the power of each of those were indelible. And they're recycled endlessly and constantly, making coin for Universal, which also re endorses all the time uh, the, the uh, immortality of them. You know, earlier when we were talking about Frankenstein, and Shane having noted that there was nothing like that. Uh, so much so that uh, two movie studios, Warner Brothers and Walt Disney, did like parody, uh, like a Hollywood uh, party. And I think in at least two of those cartoons, which are classics, you've got a caricature of Frankenstein in there. Uh, they don't say it's Boris Karloff, but it's, in essence, it removes Boris Karloff, and it's just Jack Pierce's thing walks in. Which again just hammers it home, you know, that he really, really uh, hit a nerve with that. Um, I've lost it, so that's I mean that's my <laughs> non-answer. And yeah, I mean, he, my friends covered the bases, yeah. Mr. Perry, please get into some light. Are you on mic? Uh, Come into the light. I could help. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, uh, I will say. I'm gonna actually not match any of your lists. I'm gonna say the Frankenstein monster. From the first movie, the mummy was Karloff and the Wolfman. But the Frankenstein means the Wolfman, version of the Wolfman, like you said, which is also my favorite. Thank you. I'm not going to answer the question. No. <laughs> okay. It's hard to pick though. Yes, it's a very hard choice, isn't it? I was gonna say Mr. Ed, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Um, what he means by that is Pierce, uh, after being dismissed from Universal in 1947, didn't work on great movies or shows after that. He kind of got into B-movies, he did a lot of television, he made westerns, but he has a little comeback at the end of his career. Uh, he did a picture called Creation of the Humanoid. Got, got a fan back there. Uh, Creation has some beautiful makeups, some very realistic robotic characters. And he does a nice job with them and their faces and he used scleral lenses on those characters and it was shot in color. Uh, so that's uh, his second to last film. And then he did a picture called Beauty and the Beast in 1963, that was his last movie. And he ended up on the Mr. Ed TV show. He was the staff makeup artist and uh, uh, his old friend Arthur Lubin from Universal hired him for Mr. Ed and that's when he, he finally stopped in 64 and he died uh, four years later, uh, 79. And you had mentioned uh, Bud was 29 when uh, Universal hired him. Pierce, 1947, yeah. And Pierce was, are you ready for this? 58 in the same year. Isn't that sad? Yeah. Now with the old and the new, right? But there's that mentality and that sometimes a, a negative uh, with the way the studio is run and so forth. He did one big movie, uh, I know, uh, right after that, which was, uh, Joan of Arc, which had Ingrid Bergman in it, held the cast, a beautiful production. And if you ever see it, uh, there's an interesting character of J. Carroll Nash with a kind of wounded, a scarred eye. And generally speaking, I mean, again, we have to return to the theme that the makeup artist doesn't just do monsters, but I've been going to be started yet. So, particularly back then, I mean, horror movies were sporadic items. Uh, and Jack was great at hair work, he was very, very good at beauty work. Uh, in the mode of the time. Um, there's a wonderful movie called Flesh and Fantasy that recently came out through a company called Vinegar Syndrome, I'd recommend. That was one of Jack's very last movies. It's got some nice stuff in it. Um, great hair. Uh, I'll tell you something, there's a, there's a wonderful uh, Blu-ray, my wife and I enjoyed it, a, a ton called, uh, yeah, I think, did you mention a shade or you were in The Man Who Laughs? And that is a character which, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent movie and you have no difficulty getting engrossed in it, even with uh, not being, a, even if you're not accustomed to silent films. It's got subtitles, of course, which was the way they used to have the dialogue. You know, they 
bang up the car to ask you what the person said, come back to the movie. And you get into the rhythm of that very quickly. And Flick Around, did a beautiful uh, special feature with beautiful quality set stills. And I'm damned if I didn't see Jack in like three of them. Uh, pictures of him nobody's ever seen before. So it's fun to see for a number of reasons. Uh, and it also shows what beautiful productions that Universal and all those studios would do back when they really wanted to get behind something. Beautiful sets, it's an, it's an astonishing looking movie. I want to get in a quickie thing about Lion Cheney, if I can. The fact that I think you're right, that he might have mentored Jack. Uh, Lion Sr. was a generous guy. He gave Boris Karloff a ride one day when he saw him wet and rain, looking miserable. He gave him a ride, either from the studio or to, I forget the direction. And that was where uh, Boris asked him, could you give me any advice for a struggling actor? And he said, if you can learn to do something that nobody else wants to do, do it better than anybody else you may be able to make your mark. Ta-da! You know. But Boris didn't have the opportunity until he was picked at random, not at random, but by J-12. But I mean, you know, that, that's fate and serendipity. But I want to tell a personal, personal anecdote that reinforces that story. Lon Chaney Sr. picked up my grandma and took her to work because she worked at the Universal in 1923, my mother's mother. She was just in the secretary pool. I think, imagine, first of all, recognizing, and she was with a girlfriend. And she told this story almost like, oh, well, oh yeah, that happened. <laughs> like, like, that's not J.D. Sr. for crying out loud. And uh, so I, I think that's marvelous that the business was small enough then that if you had, you know, I mean, if you had the uh, kind of spirit, I mean, you might have had uh, Jack Pierce come in here, come here and help me with this, you know, hold this while I do this. And Jack's probably soaking it all up. A lot of that, and I think you're you're going to get into it, maybe Shane, with what you brought. But uh, the materials were of the simplest kind. I mean, they didn't really have a system of make a clay wall, make a clay sculpture, make a plaster mold, flip it over, rubber, take it out, place it on. I don't know that authoritatively because they didn't record the methodologies. But we do know that they did a lot of things directly on heads that were made out of like uh, cotton and uh, you know uh, kind of intractable materials. Uh, you talked about how, and I've seen it too, where people have attempted to recreate these things and they failed spectacularly because it's very difficult. It's not to say that it's impossible, but it's goddamn hard. And Jack developed an incredible craftsmanship. I really think of him as a superb craftsman more than an artist. I've seen some of it. I still, there's a photograph of him with a, what it purports to be a Frankenstein. It's incredibly crude looking. But, but that was a, the difference between that head and what you see in his screen work is, you know, night and day. So it was really his craft, I think, that elevated uh, his intentions. Thank you so very much. I have a special surprise for all of you, including the people on stage who are going to look at the monitor. Direct your eyes to the screen. We're going to see Jack Pierce's career in 14 minutes. Please run the slideshow. And I will provide real time voiceover as you watch this. Enjoy. There he is, the man behind the monsters with a lot of his monsters back there. That's Harry Culver, Pierce's first employer in the business. Hired him to do movie theater management. That's Jack on the makeup of his own, and then he goes to Universal. This is now the teens. Look at what the studio looked like back then. It was just this one building, Universal Pictures Company, Inc. Still a lot of trees in the valley. And look at the valley at that time. That's the San Fernando Valley. Universal, the studio is in the middle. And there's Jack with a lot of his performances as an actor doing his own makeup. Does anyone recognize that? Charles Ogle's Frankenstein, the first really successful screen Frankenstein. Anyone recognize that? Dear Golem, 1920, right? These were formative to Pierce. John Barrymore is Mr. Hyde, 1920. It's a beautiful makeup. Anyone know that one? Nosferatu. Nosferatu, 1922. And these were all a huge influence on Pierce. And now we get to maybe the first totally unforgettable Cheney makeup with the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And Chinese fans of the opera. So these makeups all severely impacted Pierce. Uh, that's London After Midnight, a lost film with Lon Chaney. That man is Bill Fox. 
He gave Pierce his first biggest significant makeup job doing this simian creature in the monkey tops, which Land of the Apes looks very similar, doesn't it? Years and years later. That's Carl Emily Sr. who hires his son, Carl Emily Jr. right there, to be the head of the studio as a 21st birthday present. True story. And that's Pierce. I love this photo of the makeup department head in his smock, 1928. And this is his first big makeup at the studio, The Man Who Laughs. That's Conrad Veidt. Another shot of Veidt in getting into the makeup. That's Pierce's makeup box on the table. And then Dracula. Pierce did work on Dracula, but Bella applied his own makeup for the movie as he had done on stage. But up here, of course, Pierce did The Brides and several characters in the show. There's a picture of Lugosi doing his own makeup. He wouldn't let Pierce do the makeup. Of course, that changed later. And that is? Where's Karloff? Where's Karloff? He meets Karloff in the spring of 31, after James Well, picture here, discovers Pierce, I'm sorry, Karloff, at the Universal Commissary. This is a test makeup that Pierce did. Later, it wasn't used, but that's the finished makeup there. One of the best moments in cinema history is seeing that character for the first time. And there's Jack behind the scenes working on Karloff at the makeup bungalow that Craig said was trashed later. A posed picture of Pierce and Karloff with underlighting. Pierce's makeup bungalow had meticulous detail with regards to his formulas, his tools, his, his uh, brushes and sponges and so forth. Pierce and Otto Letterer working on the monster. This is, I believe, for, for publicity. He was so scary, they had to cover his head when he walked his head. I think that was a publicity stunt, much more than a real thing. Great shot of the monster. On the windmill at Universal City, we could walk there from here. Uh, Arthur Edison doing the setup when he comes through the door in Frankenstein, the first time we see him. There's a still from the film. Fritz, Fritz tormenting the monster. Makeup would hold up even though he got battered around some. Go and sit down. Dwight Fry as Fritz, who was in several Universal films. He's in Dracula. Does anyone know that one? The Butler Morgan from Old Dark House. That's right. Edward Van Sloan and the monster on the gurney. One of my favorites, The Mummy. The Imhotep Mummy, which you see very, very little in the finished movie. But it took eight hours to put it in that full makeup and costume. Eight hours. Top of his head, bottom of his feet. This still was posed, it's not in the finished film. There's Pierce and Karloff's wife at the time. Pierce with the hair dryer. That's the full Imhotep makeup. Took eight hours to do this, hard to believe, but Karloff was a prince. He would sit there for hours and hours and hours, <coughs> not a plane. That's Pierce working on the second character in The Mummy, Ardath Bay, who you see in most of the movie. You see this character in 90% of the movie. The original Mummy you see very, very seldom at the beginning. And there's the reward that Karloff is giving Pierce for The Mummy by the Hollywood filmograph. The Black Cat, he loved Karloff, Pierce and Karloff, had a very close relationship, and it allowed Pierce to do all these great characters, such as the black cat there. And Pierce looking at Elsa Lanchester as the bride. Uh, Elsa was probably the greatest female character Pierce ever did at the studio. There were many, there were many. I think this one was the greatest, and I agree with Aaron, I put this in the time capsule. Uh, there's the Karloff makeup from Bride. Notice how his Forehead hair has been singed off. And that's the dummy you were talking about. No, there's even a Oh, there's a different one? Oh, this is the study dummy for Brian that he did. Complete burned makeup with Una O'Connor, Ernest Thesiger from that movie. There were so many great characters in that movie, right? Even uh, Dwight Fry is in the film in a different role. Pierce and his uh, genius allowed him to do two characters for this scene at the very, very end of the film. You really don't see her very much. She just comes in the last five minutes of the movie, uh, all shot at Universal City on stage. But it's brilliant. Uh, she's memorable. If I show this picture to little kids, they incorrectly say, Dracula's wife. No, 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 no. 
not that. It's not that. Oh, he had a uh, character actor in the monster. How about that one? The Raven. No, this is The Raven, 1935. Another character by Pierce. Uh, beautiful makeup on Henry Hull. Werewolf of London. Uh, Henry did not want to be completely covered in uh, hair and appliances, so he uh, urged the studio and then communicated to Pierce to tone down the makeup so that you can see his facial features through it. It reminds me of what uh, Rick Baker did in the film Wolf with Jack Nicholson. Not a lot of makeup, just enough to give you the idea. Dracula's Daughter, I love this makeup that Pierce did. Irving Pichel from Dracula's Daughter, 1936. Uh, great movie, beautiful film. If you haven't seen this, it's a worthy sequel. Does anyone recognize that fellow? It's Vincent Price, his first movie. Jack Pierce got to make him up. And there's Bela Lugosi as Igor, his second greatest character in the studio, I believe, after, uh, obviously, Cap Dracula. And uh, the only thing that didn't work as well maybe with those teeth. Karloff, beautiful makeup, but now he's 51 years old by the time you get to Son of Frank, right? So he's not quite as gaunt, his face is filled out. Son of Frankenstein is still a tremendous film with great characters like you see right there. Tower of London, another Karloff character. Uh, the Karloff characters can't be counted, there's so many great ones. The Mummy's Hand, Tom Tyler, another Pierce character, resembles the original Mummy. And then he meets Montaigne Jr. Jr. And they had a cantankerous relationship to them. That's Dead Man's Eyes uh, that came later. Uh, you'll see Man Made Monster there. Uh, he worked a lot with Lon Chaney Jr., but Chaney Jr. wasn't the gentleman Pierce was. Didn't like putting up with the hot, sweaty, itchy makeup like you see there in The Wolfman and many other characters uh, like The Mummy. Um, the Wolfman is the greatest werewolf makeup I think ever done on a person. Uh, that doesn't take anything away from beautiful work done in American Werewolf in London and The Howling and all the others. But this is, what I, I think, the best transformation of man into wolf ever on screen. And he did it four times, uh, four films with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, the Wolfman, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula. And the great character actress Maria Ostenskaya from the first Wolfman film. Uh, does anyone know that one? David Bruce. David Bruce in? The Mad Boom, 1943. And? Bela Lugosi in? Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, and it's still both of the characters. Pierce had a lot of help by this point to do the Frankenstein makeup with a fellow named Bill Ely. Bill Ely helped him quite a bit, and there's Bella again as the monster. Um, Pierce would do the Wolfman makeup himself on most of these films, but he had assistance with this, where he's wearing a rubber headpiece by this point. He's not building it up with cotton and collodion. The Mummy's Tomb. Another Cheney character in which Pierce uh, put up with the fact that Cheney wasn't as, as excited as he could have been to get the makeup on by this point. Uh, there's what the fellow said in the video earlier. He cinched it with a curling iron uh, to give it the animal look. And there's Cheney in Ghost of Frankenstein, uh, another Pierce makeup, and Cheney in Son of Dracula. Uh, as I said, the character count is staggering in all these films. Does anyone know that one? Phantom of the Opera, which was filmed in color. Very seldom did Pierce film a color character at Universal. All of them were in black and white. John Carradine, House of Dracula, 1945. And Pierce working on Glenn Strange, who was probably the second greatest Frankenstein monster after Karloff. And there's Strange. Look at the beautiful work in House of Dracula on Glenn Strange. And look how gigantic Strange was. Pierce was 5'6". Strange was this huge guy. And working on Lon Chaney in House of Dracula. Onslow Stevens, also House of Dracula. There's Pierce and hair work. He was very good with hair. That's an obscure one. It's called The Jungle Captive, Vicki Lane in an eight makeup. And then Pierce meets perhaps his favorite people after Karloff at the studio. Adam Costello, that's Arthur Lubin in the middle, who hired Pierce on Mr. Ed uh, later in his career. But Pierce got to work with Adam Costello. He loved them. He thought they were a blast. 
and they talked to him about doing a monster rally. It never happened. That's uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and that's another Karloff character. Then Pierce goes into television. Uh, this is You Are There, where he recreated a character to be a Lincoln. As you saw at the beginning of the hour, this is uh, Pierce and Karloff on Boris Karloff's This Is Your Life episode. And they really did like each other, these men. They're about 70 now in these pictures. As a matter of fact, he turned 70 this year, Karloff, and Pierce was just a little younger. Does anyone know that one? Teenage Monster. That's very good. 1957 Teenage Monster and? The giant from the Unknown. Great, great. Yeah. Buddy Bear. Buddy Bear and Giant from the Unknown. This is Monster Palooza after all. <laughs> <laughs> and look at that. Buddy Bear getting into a bog of muck and Pierce putting him in that. Um, that's Beauty and the Beast. That's his last film. When Pierce wound down his career in films, he moved to television exclusively. There is a very old man working on Alan Young. And there's Pierce and Mr. Ed. Turn up. He looks happy about it, and it was a paycheck, but not great. There's Perry Shields playing Jack Pierce in the year 2000 in a full makeup and costume that we created for that. Uh, it's on video if you want to see it. Uh, I'll be happy to share it with you. There's Pierce and the Man Who Laughs, a recreation from our tribute in 2000. There's our Frankenstein monster created by Kevin Heaney for the film. We did three different monsters uh, for that show. Uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, done by V. Neal, who has a booth back here, if you're interested. There's our Uno O'Connor in a full prosthetic makeup. We did 16 makeups that day, 12 were prosthetically based. There's our mummy uh, from in his sarcophagus. There's Dan Roebuck on the left, and Monster Matt Thompson in Son of Frankenstein vignette. There's our Wolfman vignette with our Claude Rains and Mom Cheney Jr. That's our Evelyn Anchors. The makeup done by the great Marvin G. Westmore, who was a nephew of us. Uh, there's our Mario Spinskaya character in Claude Rains. We did a 77 minute uh, presentation that day and uh, uh, we tried to do accurate recreations of all of the great Jack Pierce characters, the Wolfman vignette. And as we see down here, that's a recreation of the actual headstone of Jack Pierce, Forest Lawn in Glendale. And that's my goal, to get in a star on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the end of the slideshow. Uh, the uh, last question I'll ask these uh, gentlemen and ladies on our stage, and Perry, you can chime in on this, is, what do you think Jack Pierce would be doing today if he was in the industry working on American Horror Story or working for Legacy Effects on one of your, at Legacy Effects and Shane Mayhem, all the Marvel films since Iron Man in 2008, they have contributed to them. And all the Star Wars Not all of them, but a lot of them. <laughs> Not all the Marvels? No. Most of them, most of them. Anyway, if he was working on uh, uh, one of your crews on a Marvel film, if he was working for you on one of your amazing films, if he was in, on your crew on The Gate, or on your crew on Dreamscape, or Altered States, or Poltergeist. So we'll start with Aaron. Imagine Jack Pierce is alive and well, it's 2023, and he's on your team. What do you think he would be doing? Well, he was, um, I think, definitely back in that time, and as well as the studio heads and a lot of makeup artists at that time, um, everybody was very secretive about how they made things. And so, um, you know, it wasn't until the 50s when Dick Smith started sharing all of his wealth with people. So nobody really knew how things were done. So I guess if he was working on one of the shows that I work on, we would have to force him <laughs> to, to like show us how he did things. And I think that that would be a huge benefit. And it is, we're always, all of us have been inspired by his makeups, as well as some of the makeups that we've created have, are, are directly in a homage to like the man who laughed is Twisty the Clown. You know, it's like there's, there's so many things that influences us. So I think there would be a lot of, of you know, giving him characters on our shows to do so we could, sit there and watch him do it as fans. So I think that's how it would work. Amazing. Thank you. Mr. Mayhem. Could Jack Pierce
create a dinosaur for one of your Jurassic films. Here's what would happen if Jack Pierce was that legacy. Nothing would happen. <laughs> no one would work. We wouldn't do anything except sit around and talk and figure out stories and have a good laugh and take him to lunch and then come back and not work another eight hours. Nothing would get done. It would just be a bunch of fans just absolutely adoring the guy. And that's, and that's really the truth of it. Now, if he was really, uh, you know, 170 years old and working at the studio, um, he would absolutely be in, in the prosthetic department or in some sort of conceptual, uh, you know, art department, uh, and that's what it would be. But honestly, I can't, I can't imagine anything getting done if he's in the studio. Starstruck. I'm going to mention another Craig Reardon character. What would Pierce be doing if he was working on your Twilight Zone crew doing the Gremlin? For nightmare at 20,000 feet. Oh, he would have been dying like I was. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, you know what? I think they answered that beautifully. And, uh, you know, putting Pierce into a modern context is almost like, you know, taking uh, somebody from the sixth century. I mean, it, it was, he would be a man out of time. Uh, he is part of a progression. And uh, we're, we're, you know, um, in that progression. Uh, one thing can't be uh, underestimated. He was absolutely inspirational. People I never even met until I met them. And he was a common, it was like a key that fit the lock with everybody. So I will say that, and I, went, and I thought of something while I was sitting here. Uh, I worked on uh, the first season of Deep Space Nine, and I was sitting around with Mike Westmore, and he just volunteered this story one day. He says, right, yeah, it reminds me of the day we, uh, Mar Marvin and I went over and saw Jack Pierce, and I said, what? I said, you did what? And he said, yeah, we went over and we found out where he lived and we went over and saw him. I said, I said, well, how did that work out? Because I thought, you know, Buck Westmore got his job and he says, he was great. I said, so he, so he was good to you guys. He says, oh, he was really nice to us. Yeah, he was very nice. He answered all our questions. We spent, you know, a happy afternoon with him, which I think is a wonderful tribute to him. He didn't, it wasn't like, uh, you know, what's your last name, you know? <laughs> No, no knives out, nothing. I, I thought that was a lovely uh, thing. And then uh, it just came out of nowhere. I just volunteered it. Of course, he you know, was in a place where he could do that, uh, both uh, being in the industry and uh, knowing who Jack Pierce was and being just the right age. Mike was probably in his 20s. Uh, yeah. When I had just gotten to know Dick Smith, uh, Jack died, same year, 68. And I was in a letter writing, you know, worshipful, you know, kind of attitude toward Dick. And I wrote him and I said, what a heartbreak I had hoped always to meet him. And he wrote me back and he said, I feel just the same as you do. He said, I always wanted to be able to use an inspiration for me. What a beautiful way to end. I would like to call our guests at the front of the stage. You can leave your microphones. We're going to convene in the downstage center. Aaron Kruger McCat. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming.